Welcome everyone to this uh, online portal for a class for your PhD uh, uh, PhD coursework and uh, although it's very difficult are for every one of us because we cannot meet within in a physical space and this online portal doesn't really provide all the kinds of provisions and all the kinds of uh, feelings or effective uh, uh, dimensions that probably make a classroom such an extraordinary event. Anyway, um, today's um, class obviously is on the, the violations that happen when we get into research publications and uh, how important it is that our publications can really be disciplinized. Where exactly are we going wrong? What are the uh, different kinds of prohibitions that uh, get Im implemented or get clamped on us institutionally and how does that affect our ways of thinking do, do we really think that this violation of uh, a writing or violation of publish pub the, the, the publishing material that probably gets translated as plagiarism is um, something that is all the time always uh, a bad thing to happen or is it that there is also something good about it although although the whole the point of this talk is that i'm not making any kind of a position here because it is it is it's not a talk where i can really claim any kind of originality of sorts because it's a kind of a classroom lecture and in a classroom lecture obviously i really have to give you certain uh, uh, within a certain kind of a spread i really have to give you different kinds of ideas about uh, what constitutes this very idea of plagiarism, primarily humanities, because uh, I think uh, I'm not qualified enough really here to talk about the plagiarism or the different kinds of violations that happen when one makes a publication in a science journal, primarily say physics, chemistry or other disciplines. But um, uh, the, the way we actually conduct ourselves in the humanities um, the way we get into our publication, our research, the methodologies and different kinds of things that really come into our understanding of publication as such uh, uh, require that we come to a point where we try to understand understand rather what plagiarism can really mean. So let us let us let us begin by uh, uh, by 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 talking about um, an essay by uh, Michael Grossberg, who is talking about the history and the disciplining of plagiarism. And when he's talking about that, he is primarily mentioning uh, the, the kind of definition of plagiarism that uh, American Historical Review provides. And uh, uh, one of the most important forums to, for publication. And uh, the definition that um, American Historical Review provides actually have five central tenets. And the first one is that, probably the most basic, is to define plagiarism as a kind of appropriation of the exacting wording of another author without attribution. Now, uh, this, is, this is something that I will talk later, of course, uh, that whether it is really the metaphor of theft that comes into play, or is this violation something that is intentional, a violation that is institutional, or is it that a violation is very much a part of a culture or it's very much a part of a heritage of writing? We will, we will talk about that, rather touch upon those things uh, later when I finish this lecture with you all. But the second point that um, this AAHR's definition of plagiarism talks about is that it broadened the ethical misted to include the appropriation without proper attribution of another person's concepts, theories, rhetorical strategies and interpretations and, uh, and then of course the third one uh, is that the that, that, that age that is American historical uh, uh, reviews definition declares that plagiarism to be the failure to acknowledge the work of another regardless of intent or of monetary or other forms of gain uh, that when I talk about the monetary, it's very important that you know when you talk about this question about plagiarism as a kind of uh, as kind of a theft, that you are just not stealing ideas out of someone someone's writing. the The real problem is that when you are stealing some some idea and when you're stealing a word, there is a difference in the way you op operate on this on this axis of plagiarism as such. So it's 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 very important for one to realize that when one is stealing words when you are quoting sentences or quoting 
uh, lines without proper proper acknowledgement or without with, without proper acceptance or um, without without proper uh, uh, referencing that you're expected to do or when you are actually stealing an idea i mean when you steal an idea the the idea is that if you really appropriate an idea what kind of a difference will that make to your understanding of the whole question of um, plagiarism as such so here comes the fourth definition that is provided by American Historical uh, uh, Review and the definition is that it recognizes that the appropriation of another's words or ideas without proper attribution constituted an ethical and professional but not a legal infraction unless it slid into copyright infringement and uh, finally of course the 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 age is a declaration uh, enforcement to be it, it, it they want it to be a, not an individual responsibility obviously it has to be a collective responsibility and very interestingly this whole idea of the individualism in terms of plagiarism and individualism in terms of the violation as, as a kind of a collective act this also is an interesting sort of an analysis or interesting sort of a dynamic that we can come to later Obviously, I'm not very sure about whether within an hour's time we'll be able to cover all these areas, but we will try to get to a point where we will have some kind of an idea about or any kind of a conspectus and get our outlines clear about what are these violations. So the, the fifth one and the final one um, uh, is from this, this forum is that all historians, they share responsibility for maintenance of the highest standards of intellectual integrity when appraising manuscripts for publication reviewing books or say evaluating peers for placement promotion and tenure then a scholar must evaluate the honesty and reliability with which the historians uses primary and secondary source materials and this is um, interesting because um, the scholarship you know it it, it, it flourishes in an atmosphere of openness and candor, there has to be a sort of um, honesty about this scholarship. And it, it, it is interesting also that, you know, when one appropriates an idea and uh, doesn't make any mention of that, or, or, or really, really lifts certain sections of one's work to really qualify or to really pass it on as one's own, then... Um, there is a sense not only of infringement, there is not only a sense of a violation of, of, of your rights to writing or your rights to thinking, but at the same time it does affect you emotionally. It does affect a person who feels that he is being deprived of acknowledgement or deprived of mention. So uh, this is also something that violation can create a kind of a kind of an impact on the emotional level as well. There is the, the question of violation being a kind of an effective act. So that is also one part. But the point that I was, uh, I, I was just about uh, trying to make before I moved on to discuss these uh, five, uh, these six uh, uh, principles from the American Historical Review Forum is that it is, it is a question of stealing when you do that. It's just not stealing words. It's, 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 it's also the question of appropriating ideas at the same time you are also taking credits because the you know the credit in the sense of the economy credit in the sense of money because when someone is not being given the right then that also in a way tends into someone's earnings from that which is also a way of looking at the economic side of this violation of uh, ethical responsibility to writing so this is um, something that uh, they speak of, that scholarship flourishes in an atmosphere of openness and candor, which should include the scrutiny and discussion of academic deception. So there is some kind of deception that seems to work in, um, in, in the violation. And uh, whether the deception really in a way, in a way uh, uh, emboldens the person who is doing it, the perpetrator, or whether it's it it is a part of the very act of writing, is 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 definitely a moot issue because I um, this is not really the right space, the right forum to really make my position about what constitutes the distinctions between originality and plagiarism 
looked at as intertextuality because um, how many times do you think Tagore has really acknowledged his appropriations from Vedanta, Hadu Upanishad, or, um, uh, or, or there are lots of modernist texts in the 20th, 20th century which, uh, who have, uh, these texts have really gone into doing a lot of intertextual work and intertextual networking. But um, I dare say, even in postmodernism for that matter, I dare say that there, there hasn't been much of this culture of extremely meticulous, discriminative acknowledgement of sources. Uh, this is also very much a part of the, uh, the American institutionalism, uh, uh, which we are all almost consumed by, where, where every single word that we use, I mean, I would go to that point, I was ridiculously saying that if someone uses and, that and also needs to be somehow footnoted or endnoted and be shown that, well, I've quoted and from this particular person or particular source. But whatever be the case, you know, this, um, idea of uh, uh, this violation is also something that has a lot to do with um, authorship. I, I, I would say that what kind of author are you when you are plagiarizing? I mean, when you know that uh, the, the, if you have written 200 words and you know that your 100 words actually uh, do not belong to you and you have borrowed it from someone else without actually acknowledging the, the whole act, then is it that uh, we can talk about candor or is it that it's a deceptive art? So if it's a deceptive art where you are trying to in a way deceive the reader into believing that what they are reading actually is your product or actually something that is coming out of you or your own system or your, or your own ability, what sort of a problem does that create? Because the whole idea of authorship, you know, if, um, if one goes back to understand that, really tells a different story. Um, uh, uh, the uncertainty, as Grosberg points out, is that the uncertainty about the nature and meaning of authorship um, is, is another very distinctive point about plagiarism. And, um, and Grosberg also notes that these studies in the history of the book and scholarship and literary criticism, uh, uh, they have really compelled us to re-examine our fundamental belief in the author as an original thinker. So, originality. This is another very interesting, uh, both aesthetic, political, and uh, uh, definitely an, 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 an a very interesting critical issue when one talks about who is original. Uh, uh, is Aristotle original or was Plato original? Or is it that uh, any, any philosopher from our age is more original than Plato? in spite of the fact that they're working on Plato, in spite of the fact that they're, they're advancing an idea that, 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 that Plato puts out. And I, I do know of many texts, actually, which uh, just do not refer uh, in their footnotes the kind of ideas that um, they are trying to appropriate. I, I do know of various texts of the American poet Robert Frost, just to, just to mention, and these are the little things that have got into his uh, thought system. These are, the, the, these are the little items that really have uh, moved in or, or somehow got enmeshed in the way he writes. So he, 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 he is oblivious to the very act of mentioning them with a kind of institutional precision. So would that be a theft? Would it that really be a, a kind of a violation of originality? Would it that be anything that's short of originality, the way we look at it? Or is it that originality can be an idea where you just can talk about anything as if that is your first word. And that is the first word that you have uttered in the history of the human civilization or the history of ideas. Now, this is a problem. I mean, this, this is something that um, doesn't concern us much here because the, 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 the talk, as I said, the lecture is a classroom talk, as I said, and I cannot make my position about how plagiarism can really be seen as a kind of an aesthetic act because that would probably be more confusing to all of you here. We're trying to listen and trying to understand that uh, what does violation of uh, uh, writing or violation of publishing can really mean. But that is something which we can uh, uh, take up a little later. I mean, maybe towards the end of this talk, maybe I can just talk a bit about uh, what, what that really means or what that really signifies or what implications it might hold. So... Um, Grosberg, coming to Grosberg again, I mean, it's, it's uh, the story in Grosberg. This has also led us to reconsider whether an author has or should have a property claim 
uh, to words or ideas and evidence clashes and uh, also whether such claims clash with an equal, equally vital commitment uh, to, to the free flow of Im information. So if there is a free flow of idea and if there is a free flow of information, how, how was it that my appropriating something can really be considered as a theft or really be considered as a cross violation? Or, as I said, uh, a momentous act of deception. Now, plagiarism or this whole idea of the violations is emerged in, in early modern Europe from the confluence of technological intellectual and legal change that uh, promoted exclusive and exclusionary authorial rights. Now, in our time, Grosberg notes that this postmodern claims about the cultural contingency of all social constructions have fostered uncertainty about the link between textual construction and ownership, that challenge, that understanding of plagiarism. Now, uh, what we what we generally do is that um, uh, say 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 sometimes when we are writing when we are trying to think something out and uh, we are we, we are trying to put an idea into a paper there there are thoughts that we have learned over the over the certain period of time there are certain ideas that we have educated ourselves in but something that we never bothered to check out the source something that we all the time thought is very much a part of our growing up, a part of our learning, without we really trying to find where exactly those sources were. Is it that when we are writing uh, in that mode, uh, does it really mean that uh, we are stealing? So in that case, uh, will any kind of a reference to uh, local cultural history involve a copyright? Is it that what we're really learning in course of our writing can really mean that we are putting ourselves uh, at peril and, uh, and, 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 and probably be accused of plagiarism later. So um, the notion of stealing ideas you know, or words is not only modern, it's also profoundly Western. I'll come to the Chinese part of it a little later. Um, because students from Middle Eastern or Asian or African cultures, you know, they're baffled by the very notion that one can own ideas. I mean, I, uh, this is my idea. I mean, I, if I'm putting out an idea, say, uh, 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 for instance, um, I, I put out an idea very recently on all trance and fusion. So if I'm really putting that idea out and say that this is my idea, so is it that every time someone uses the word infusion or someone uses the word trance infusion in any kind of writing for that matter, for that matter, I mean, if someone is actually doing historical writing or any kind of a scientific writing, that person starts to use this word trance infusion without actually knowing that I have really used this term. Because when I have actually put this term out, then I did not really uh, uh, stand to it or, or a hector about that this is a term that should have a universal sounding to it. So whoever really uses this term should really ensure that that person is in a way affiliating to the, the, the way the, the usage has been made or is it that? It's something of, of that sort that, uh, I mean, it, it really to declare that this is a word that, uh, that Gauche has used so that uh, you really do not remain in any kind of a danger of a charge of plagiarism. So it is, it is very, it is very um, uh, surprising, for, especially for students from the, the, the Middle, East, Middle East and the Asian, the African cultures, where they are largely, largely bemused and baffled by the whole idea of someone really owning an idea, which is typically Western. And now with American institutionalism, I think um, uh, this has really become something that is uh, astoundingly stringent. And, um, and and very nervy. I mean, when you finish an article at all the time, you need to have a plagiarism checker, as my PhD students, they obviously do, that even if they submit, they need, they need to go to a plagiarism checker, which actually starts to tell you that you cannot, um, you can submit your thesis if probably you, you, you are below 10% or 15%. I, I'm not really sure about that percentage yet at this moment. But I think it's around 10 or 15% that you have to be there. But if you are, if you are really, being 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 identified of having uh, having a dissertation that is plagiarized up to 10 or 15 percent uh, doesn't really bother so i mean is it what kind of a 
what kind of an interesting and I would say a delectable ethics that really comes out of this. So um, students from uh, say the culture of media for that matter sharing promoted by the internet may well be teaching students an idea of information as, uh, as an intellectual commons uh, uh, open to all users and which probably is at odds with the beliefs of most of the faculty and the, and the most definitions of plagiarism. So that is also something that um, uh, it's very important for us to know. Uh, I, I somehow feel that um, this, there is a sort of a, there is a sort of a, uh, there is a definitely, of course, the urgency and the difference in the significance in the way one looks at plagiarism. And, and certainly uh, I have no problems with that. I certainly don't dispute and in any way contest that idea. But I somehow feel there's this, this uh, property rights claims to scholarship um, uh, uh, that, is, that is completely based on the assertions of authorial originality um, uh, that in a way starts to ignore the interdependence of scholars and, 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 and also the, it's, it's undermines the scholarly communications in many disciplines. Because um, somewhere if I'm dependent on you to really make a point through what you call a strong infusion, uh, should I be nervy? Should I really be hesitant? Should I should I all the time think that where is this word coming from? If I'm really using this word trans infusion, I really need to dig into the internet and see that whether or probably dig into all those bibliographical references to see who is the original owner or proprietor of this particular idea. So uh, that way probably scholarly interdependence would um, largely not be uh, a kind of a vibrant, cheerful and um, an, an delectable free flow of ideas. Uh, rather, it would just be crowded, congested by footnoting. And every single word that I would like to talk to you about or every single sentence that I would like to write would all the time give me the shadow of someone uh, being the originator of those particular words. So, th th there is a necessity at the same time, I pro probably there is also the necessity of disallowing a kind of an overdoing of this whole principle and this, this very act of plagiarism, as you call it. So, um, uh, you know, that, uh, this, this, what I'm actually telling here, uh, and what I'm, the point that I'm trying, trying to make in this, 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 this address, is that there is definitely uh, a complication that I'm trying to introduce in the very understanding of this violations of, of writing, or the ethics of writing, and uh, they also probably make us uh, make us worry about that the restrictive definition of plagiarism and activist activist plagiarism it is probably in a way policing the disciplines a bit too much and probably stifling the the need for disciplinary debates um, again that's controversial i'm not making my position but i'm certainly making a uh, one side of the story here to say that whether such um, almost um, uh, almost almost a kind of a uh, uh, very, very, uh, the heated, heated debate on what is being plagiarized and what should not be plagiarized, or whether actually plagiarism should at all exist, and who would really decide that what is plagiarism and what is not. Uh, just not limiting ourselves to uh, the understanding that plagiarism is about discrediting or uncrediting the originator of a particular sentence or an idea, how much of how much uh, uh, how effective would that be? Probably that's that's the question. Uh, these are different questions that one can star oneself up and see whether uh, we can really find a sort of a solution or or, or, or find a way out where this sort of um, almost vitriolic uh, policing of the borders of what you write and what you transgress. Uh, somehow gets um, reactivated on a different axis or probably gets a, a different kind of a premise to work with. Um, coming to the coming to uh, uh, the University of Oxford's website where 
when 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 talks about plagiarism you know it's like when you come to that they have a very um very very unequivocal in that matter and uh, this is what they really have to say that it should be wrong to describe plagiarism as only a minor form of cheating or as merely a matter of academic etiquette on the contrary, it's important to understand that plagiarism breach of academic integrity. Um, this is an interesting question because when one talks about this whole uh, question of understanding and whole question of writing, then how much of um, how would you how would you really bring these uh, this this uh, uh, these concepts into play? We start to talk about cheating. Uh, etiquette and integrity. So isn't that whatever you write, uh, whatever you think of writing and decide to write, would involve, um, uh, before you get down to your desk, or before you start to put your, uh, start to get your ink on paper, I mean you should, you should start to think about whether, whether it is, am I cheating? Am I maintaining a sort of a decorum, uh, a, a sort of an appropriate etiquette uh, in my understanding and in my writing? Or if I'm not, then what would be my academic integrity? So when I'm finishing a paper, then I finish it off and after completion, I look back to see whether my academic integrity is anyway compromised. So what would be that integrity? Is integrity only about footnoting? Is integrity only about uh, uh, referencing and, 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 and acknowledging every single word, every single idea that you have, that you have probably borrowed from someone or it could be also a, a way of looking at it in a very agnotological way where you are somewhat ignorant about uh, a certain references that you've made you could be it could be that you have spoken about some great philosophical idea without having read Kant it could be that you have put in a, a, a great observation about a historical event which without actually knowing that it has al already been worked on or already been propagated, already been, already been put out. So this, this is the problem that one starts to face. This is the problem that one starts to face when one gets to the very question or the very principle of the platform of integrity in academic writing. Um, as I said, uh, as, I, as, I, as I just about, uh, just a while ago mentioned that um, it, is, it is difficult, you know, to, to really understand what would be the attitudes towards uh, authorship. And um, Karen Bennett has, 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 has a, a very nice essay called The Geopolitics of Academic Plagiarism. And Bennett has uh, pointed out that attitudes towards authorship, originality, and intellectual property have not always been what they are today. Say, for instance, in um, the medieval scholasticism where the term author of the octa was reserved for those ancient authorities that had produced great truths in accordance with Christian doctrine and contemporary writers considered mere as scriptors or compilators or commentators. Now, they, they, they were expected to copy them as faithfully as possible for the purpose of dissemination. Bennett also uh, it's, it's, it's carefully points that, in fact, this, this decontextualized fragments of text from ancient sources circulated freely at this time with no reference to the original author at all. And this is an important observation. And uh, uh, as I will say that similarly in humanism where imitation had an important part to play in the learning process. So when you're imitating someone, would you go back and say that, oh, I have actually learned to eat, so I have learned to eat from my mother. So once you start to eat, would you all the time think that whom have I learned this eating from? Is it that my mother or is my father? So if I really say that I've learned it from my father, which incidentally is not the case where you've learned it from your mother, then would it actually be that um, it's theft? Would it be a violation? Now, this is uh, this is an issue which I'm, 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 I'm slightly settling on at this moment and uh, dealing with you all and trying all of you to somehow see whether uh, this aspect of the whole violation can interest you or stir you in a different way. Not encouraging you to be violators, but trying to try to make you understand the whole politics and understanding and dynamics of violation. 
So, um, as I said, that imitation um, it really had a very, very significant role to play in, in the learning process. And students would copy tropes and, and, and phrases of the masters into commonplace books for incorporation into their own work. Now, indeed, the notion that um, words or maybe ideas are the two very important parameters can be owned only really developed in the 16th and 17th century. So when this around the 16th and 17th centuries that they started to decide that, well, uh, uh, this word and this idea actually belongs to me. I am the owner. So I have this, this has a complete proprietorship over it. This, this, this particular principle, this particular tradition, it starts to build around the 16th and 17th centuries when the emergence of the market for print meant that people could now earn a living by publication. So if I have written something and it's been published, so I'm going to earn the money. I mean, you cannot just steal my work and sell it so that I am deprived of earning what I have actually written. So which is why I use the term credit uh, when I spoke about the theft at the very beginning of this talk. Now, um, um, it is also something that uh, interesting to see whether we can really talk about this, uh, the geopolitical uh, way that Bennett actually looks at and the geopolitical uh, accelerations of academic cultures. Because, you know, what is plagiarism in, in the Western culture may not be a plagiarism in the Chinese culture or, uh, for that matter, in the Hindu culture. So it is important that um, uh, what these modern dictionaries do is that the modern dictionaries, they tend to be very laconic in, in, in the way they define this whole idea of violation. And by doing that, what they do is that uh, uh, they are trying to, in a way, limitize, trying to bring the whole idea of uh, understanding plagiarism within very restrictive corridors of understanding. But again, we need to go through that because that is what our understanding should be. So. Here it says that um, there is there is some way that if you are appropriation of articles or ideas of others, if that is going on without any kind of uh, acknowledgement, that's a literary theft. Now, if it's a literary theft, then um, uh, what happens to those uh, those 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 kind of dimensions in people's work where you don't need an acknowledgement? I mean, there can be certain certain kinds of writing where you don't need acknowledgement. Um, and I, I just give you, of course, a very formal example, a rather rather rustic one, saying that if you were really going down to eat, that would you just say that whether I learned it from my brother or my mother or my sister or father? So it is, it is a kind of a rustic example of actually showing that. But the question remains that, well, uh, would it be that? Would it be this, this, this literary theft? Would it really be that you're paraphrasing with only minor alterations? Uh, would that be a theft? Would it be collusion? Would it be inaccurate citation? Um, would it be the failure to acknowledge all assistance? And uh, would it be that you are recoursing to professional agencies and maybe that's a self plagiarism as such? So all these, all these thoughts actually um, can be considered when you are uh, generally talking about uh, plagiarism. But um, it is also a, a very interesting fact that um, what would one do with stealing? And uh, the, the stealing is uh, an interesting fact because, you know, when you write a book, when, when one publishes a paper, then there is a contract paper that one needs to sign. Very recently I had published a paper and I had to sign a contract paper with a press called Nebraska University Press, whose journal I published in. So I had to really sign that contract paper only after that that the paper gets published. Only after that the paper actually reaches the readers. So there is a contract. Now what does that contract say? That's a, a very interesting and a difficult question at this moment because it doesn't have much time for that. But this contract is what you have with an institution. And when you're writing, you have a contract with the thoughts and the ideas as well. You have a contract with the books and the papers, the resources, the sources that you are reading. So all 
all you all your the process of writing at the same time the way you write involves a kind of an understanding of a contract both 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 in in a sense uh, a perceptible in a perceptible uh, signed non signed i mean that's the way uh, you, you start to look at the whole question of the contract and so um when one makes this modern academic transactions uh, like other marketplace operations, they're all governed, as, as, as you know, by the relationships of contract, which in a way presuppose the a need for transparency and respect for certain fundamental rights. Now, such as the right to property, the right to the fruits of one labor, and so on. So, whether pl plagiarism then becomes framed as a theft, a fraud, or a simple dishonesty, it is therefore constitutes a breach of contract. I mean, that's that's where uh, the intellectual property rights also can be an interesting uh, program in place, which inevitably injures other parties. And that could be the authors, it could be teachers, it could be examiners, it could be fellow students, the academic institution, um, whose name probably can be tarnished, and, and future employers as well, or in some high-profile cases, the public at large. So, um, uh, interestingly, uh, this, this question about contract becomes very important and uh, we need to understand that contract is uh, very much a part of our understanding of the violation or what do you call it, the ethical violation. Now, um, the other points that um, one can talk about here is that uh, when it comes to sciences, uh, in, in, in sciences, then things can be a little different. I mean, I, uh, the, the, all the kinds of points that I'm making here uh, primarily pertain to, uh, uh, to, to humanities because um, I'm talking from the perspective of a, a literature professor. So the, the, the whole idea of um, fact and the whole idea of truth I mean, where, 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 do, where do you think these two terms exist when you are talking about an axis where there is truth and there is fact? I mean, there can be facts that you, that you are quoting without sources, but there is also certain truths that you know, and there are certain truths that you are aware of and certain truths that you have been living with, which um, get into your writing and um, which, in a way, uh, uh, which in a way doesn't really actually require any kind of referencing or any kind of uh, bibliographical prominence. Now, um, the answer probably that Bennett talks about is that it's that a kind of a fact that science purpose to reveal are merely claims that, uh, that have been sanctioned by the discourse community. So there is a certain kind of truth that the discourse community sanctions and that kind of a truth is something that you have to refer to every time you, 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 you get to writing or get to engage with that particular particular principle or particular quantum of truth. But the construction of academic facts, you know, is a social process. And with the cache of acceptance only bestowed on a claim, after negotiations with editors, expert reviewers and journal readers, the final ratification granted, of course, with the citation of the claim by others, and eventually, the disappearance of all acknowledgement as it is incorporated into the literature of the discipline. So, um, uh, what happens is that, that there is a clear discrepancy, as Bennett notes, between the constructed nature of scientific knowledge and its meta discourse of transcendent truth, and this possibly raises the most complex challenge to the whole issue of plagiarism. Traditional science textbooks at undergraduate as well as high school level tend to present accepted knowledge as incontrovertible fact using grammatical structures such as nominalizations, impersonal verb forms and cause and effect linkers to build a picture of an objectivity existing world from which all human agency is removed. Um, it is therefore not surprising that if students are perplexed when they are faced with all the messiness and uncertainties of science in the making, and this is interesting also that the, the issue of plagiarism, you know, once one talks about this, that how hard can the truth be, how hard can the fact be, how, how self-enclosed and self-imprisoned can 
a certain factor or, or, or a certain idea be? Well, uh, and that's debatable, but this issue of plagiarism probably um, then becomes a kind of a minefield that one has to be very adept to negotiate. I, this is the, 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 real, the real crux of what I'm actually trying to say that you know it is a minefield it, it, it is not a kind of uh, uh, a to-do list that one needs to do of course that's the way it's being looked at but probably i would i would ask you that this is not a kind of a pontification that i'm providing here with what is what are the things that you need to do to avoid plagiarism i mean that is something you can just get in a kind of a plagiarism uh, a manual but what i'm trying to ask you to do here or what i'm actually trying to uh, put out for my for for the, for the listeners here is that whether plagiarism can really be revised as a kind of a minefield where the whole question of the theft metaphor can uh, uh, really be uh, re-questioned like uh, Amy Robilla does that. But um, uh, uh, this, is, uh, this is this whole, the something of a minefield that uh, you really have to be very skillful and uh, you, have to be, you have to be very alert while you're negotiating that. But no wonder that there are so many students that's foreign domestic they take a safe path of you know constructing their text as patchworks or mosaics of reference citations from different sources in which their own input is limited to linking those sources together. I repeat this because this is a very important one because um, uh, uh, the only way that you can stay out of trouble is that you create a kind of a quotational architecture in your your writing. And when you this a quotational architecture then every time there is a kind of a footnote so you know you know in a one single page it might just happen that you have those numericals come kind of almost almost beaming at you saying one two three four five six and your whole whole attention is probably not just exclusively focused on the text but you continuously your eyes eyeball starts to move between the text and the footnotes continues to see that what references you have made so you know it is um it is a way of a very safe path though i i, I would admit that but it constructs a text as a patchwork, you know, it's, it's, it's a kind of a mosaic of reference citations from different sources. So primarily, primarily what happens is that it, 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 it does create a sort of a difficulty, and, and not only in terms of uh, and the quality, but also in terms of the understanding of the material. Um, it, is, it, is, it is all the time a kind of a responsibility, a kind of an urgent responsibility that one writer has to differentiate one's position from other and continuously by quoting others and then on the basis of the quotations that the person has made, he starts to, he or she starts to really build his own har har discourses. And this, um, uh, this does create a very interesting uh, uh, thing that I want to talk about here. And again, I'm coming back to the whole idea of the imitation that exists uh, when one talks about um, plagiarism or violation, because um, it is not very easy, you know, uh, to, as I said, that in within this, this very intricate understanding of plagiarism, it's not very easy to de determine that whether you are actually uh, uh, painted a little by the brush of plagiarism or you, you really have been able to completely stay unbrushed. Like um, you, when, when you are talking about imitation or copying, uh, how does that work? I mean, uh, uh, if one goes to China for the matter and uh, let, us, let, us, let us read with Joel Block as he talks about the plagiarism across cultures. And uh, he, 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 Joel Block actually puts out that when, when China has a long tradition of literacy, the importance it places on collectivism, you know, is, is often seen as a dichotomous to the Western concept of individualism. So uh, here comes the, here immediately the idea of plagiarism and the idea of violation of publication stands stands very complicated. It, it does become fraught with different kinds of nuances and different kinds of meaning which one really needs to unravel to understand exactly what this whole idea of the theft metaphor means. So it is often assumed that um, this collective nature devalues the romantic concept of authorship prevalent in the West because collectivism really starts to challenge that and places a greater value on imitation uh, uh, because it's been seen, uh, 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 it's been thought that China is more of a collective society. 
it's been assumed that there is less concern for how intellectual property is appropriated or attributed. So therefore, a greater degree of limitation in the creation of a new intellectual property is both encouraged and valued. So these assumptions underlie the belief that all English language learners bring to the classroom a different value system in regard to plagiarism than the one prevalent in the West. And um, uh, uh, it, 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 is, there, is there a very universal principle of plagiarism or is it that plagiarism is something that one can, uh, one can relate to individual cultures, one can talk about um, the understanding of uh, uh, the very idea of collectivity or individuality or to certain cultural ethers or is it that it should really have an overarching transcendental principle to it? This is also one, uh, one, one significant point that uh, one can ruminate over. Now, there is the forms of plagiarism. It can also be acts of resistance to the dominant forms of rhetoric, especially where these forms contradict the students' own, very own epistemological traditions. And um, what happens is that at the heart of these misunderstandings as block nerds is that it's been the assumption that originality and imitation about which I spoke at the beginning of the start are opposites in the same way that individualism and collectivism are. So uh, how is it that you, you imitate it without be actually being original? So uh, I mean, if when P.T.S. Eliot says that the best boy steals, I mean, it's like, how how does the best boy steal? What kind of a stealing is going on here? And is it a stealing which uh, Elliot would admit is very much um, uh, uh, and a plagiarism? Or is it that it would be a very aesthetic way of looking at, a very constructive way of looking at plagiarism? That's also a question that uh, stays on and stays to disturb us a lot. But a romantic view of artistic creation has led some to denigrate the value of imitation. So the Westerners, um, they memorize, they imitate, they plagiarize all the time. Imitation in the form of using other people's ideas is seen in the West as intertextuality. So memory pervades everything we say and write. And as Alton Becker he, he, he points out that in the history of our particular interactions, whether it's oral or written, builds each of us a domain of discourse, a constantly changing, drifting domain of discourse in which we live and have an identity. So, interestingly, you know, in our postmodern views of academic writing, that's also of a debatable area, and we certainly don't have time for that, uh, which, which, of course, um, I might pick it up later when I talk again. But in the postmodern views of academic writing, you know, we memorize the writings of the giants and use them in our papers to show that we have read them, that they agree with us. And if they disagree, they either must be wrong or discussing something different. So that is what we do. And, you know, imitation, it continues, as Bloch says, to be associated primarily with so-called collectivist cultures. Uh, say, such as China, which values the imitations of previous knowledges as an expression, you know, of the connection between past and present. So this dichotomy between uh, individualism and collectivity has been strongly challenged by many researchers in Chinese thought. And individualism and collectivism are not mutually exclusive, but are deeply integrated in Chinese culture. This is an important point that uh, uh, makes the whole idea of understanding plagiarism uh, this to build up a different order. So an individual in Chinese society can be concerned with herself as an individual and with the society at the same time. So both individualism and collectivism are handshaking here in this particular culture. And so the whole question of trying to bring a very universal, a kind of bring an immanent question of, 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 of plagiarism uh, might just not work. Because then, of course, um, there's the policing of the distinctness of a particular culture comes into play. And that is something which probably is not very welcome. So um, we can see uh, the same in a Chinese rhetorical tradition as well, where there is no question that Chinese learning emphasizes the imitation of uh, traditional forms of intellectual property. And learning is shaped at an early age by the importance given in literary instructions 
to to memorizing characters and imitating the classic writings of the sages. I mean, that's very much a part of Chad's culture. And achieving literacy requires that the, the rote memorization of characters. So you start to memorize them. And when you do that, you know, Chinese children, they are taught that it is not enough to learn to write. One must also imitate the traditional stroke order for every character. And from this perspective, how Chinese writers appropriate text is deeply inherent in Chinese culture. So, uh, it, it, as, as Bloch beautifully um, puts it, and very perceptively puts it though, that the Chinese have often reflected on this question of imitations and originality. And uh, this is where, again, as I said, that whole idea of plagiarism becomes a virtual minefield. Now, there is a Chinese saying that perhaps somewhat sarcastic, but it goes this way, that memorizing 300 poems from the Shang Dynasty, even if you don't know how to write, you can steal the pieces to write a poem. Steal, the whole question of the theft. That is the important part about the whole question of writing and the whole question of trying to understand what constitutes appropriate legitimate writing. So how can how, how do we view citations as these where you say that if you or a little sarcastically that if you can't write then you just you're just stealing pieces to write a poem then how do you view the citations uh, such as this would it be an act of theft an act of learning or would it be an act of creation now I'm not getting into that very interesting debate on plagiarism that even 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 the traditions of Western learning has, I mean, I'm talking about the, the, the whole question about the 17th century and uh, uh, of course you can get that in Arabic literary criticism, in Arabic poetics as well, where they are talking about this idea of plagiarism becoming, becoming a kind of a deceptive art and, and not considering plagiarism as something that is um, reprehensible or, or in a way, um, uh, in a way uh, egregiously uh, derogatory. So that's, that's not what it is. But the question remains that would it be an act of theft and, or, and, and if it's an act of theft, would it actually be an act of learning? If it's an act of learning, then would it be an act of creation? Now, regardless of the answers, we can recognize in this saying that our that the Western concept of intertextuality comes into play, and this is where the a debate becomes very interesting. And uh, uh, this saying also recognizes the value imitation has on the production of original knowledge. So you, you, you really have to imitate someone to only to be original, or is it that you're original without imitating others? Is it that you are you can be original without quoting others? But if you are original by quoting others, should you all the time be quoting others only to prove that you are legitimately original? So I'm raising certain questions. So, which obviously. Um, helps you to, to, to put yourself in a kind of a thought blender. But we can see this traditional Chinese way of thinking repair in contemporary thinking about intellectual property. And uh, the term remixing now comes into play. And uh, this has come to be like, for instance, Lawrence Lessig, he, he has applied this term, this, this, this remixing uh, to how new forms of intellectual property are created from um, uh, are created from all forms and how to suggest the thoughts that all text remix prior text to create something new so perhaps the chinese approach to memori memorization and originality is not dramatically different from what is found in the west perhaps not therefore the importance given today to this intertextuality in all forms of writing has made it necessary to rethink attitudes to plagiarism and especially as it applied to non-Western cultures. So, uh, finally, I mean, when I'm just drowning off my, uh, uh, my, my talk here to say that uh, how can we then revise this whole question of the theft metaphor? Because the interesting thing is that whether plagiarism now actually or those violations of writing can really be considered to be an ethical issue, would you say it's a criminal issue? Or could it be a textual issue? Or could it be an aesthetic issue? That these are things that remain as genuine questions to be taken up and debated. And interestingly enough, um, uh, we start to think that uh, as with, with Amy Robillard a lot uh, in, in the later part of this conversation to think that uh, 
uh, how does one really this, this, uh, try to understand the impact of internet technology and plagiarism? And uh, uh, internet has really affected, as Robin Lynn notes, that it's, it's been very much affected by the students' access to text. And uh, uh, once students really have internet access to text, then teachers also access to software designed to detect plagiarism, to the acts where the students access to text to determine whether which of the texts they have accessed and whether they have accessed that in a proper legitimate way. So the appropriateness uh, comes into play. So internet has, uh, in a way, um, you can also look at the whole issue this way, the internet in a way has produced an access at the same time as produced a way to police that access. So in a way, even the ubiquity of published uh, repairs to crime and increase in internet plagiarism. So internet plagiarism also becomes an issue here. And it becomes uh, so difficult that we start to uh, talk about this, this, this um, whole idea of the copy-paste and this copy-paste syndrome, or we can call it the copy-paste cult of uh, academic writing, which is very much there. And that's the reason why um, it is also becomes a rather difficult when someone gets to read a paper uh, sent by a journal as a reader and I'm, when I'm reading a paper as a reviewer um, then also there are high chances that this paper is not being published so there are chances that the reader might just try to pick certain quotations, certain lines, certain paragraphs out of that particular essay and just about uh, consider that to be his or her own and without making any kind of an acknowledgement because very interestingly when you get that paper uh, when you get a research paper by, by a, a journal that sends you to, to read a review, you do not get the name of that person there. So it's a blind peer review. So when you're doing a blind peer review, you don't exactly know the, the name of the author. So it is a way of reading something anonymous. So when you're reading something anonymous, what happens is that you might just be tempted to pick certain sentences, pick certain ideas, pick references, out of that paper and then just about incorporate that or allow it to really somehow flow into your your current writing and once it gets into your writing you know that you don't really have to mention because you don't know the name of that person and that person's paper if eventually you reject that also might not be published so these are little problems that uh, one little next months need to look look into this whole business of internet plagiarizations where uh, you are actually, you are actually, in a way, decontextualizing plagiarism. You are, in a way, multi-contextualizing plagiarism. At the same time, pluralizing uh, uh, plagiarism. So, things um, such as this uh, probably, probably brings us finally to the, a certain, a certain sense and prescriptive issues about what would really then constitute the ethics of writing. Um, to be to be honest with you all, its ethics of uh, the writing would probably be what you actually mean. So the whole idea of the define, and once you uh, you know, define what actually the ethics of writing is, then you start to assign, and from assign you try to prevent, and from prevent you move on to being suspicious. So you suspect, and from suspicion you just move to detection, that is detect. So. There is an important business that comes up, a very important understanding of this very act of violation. Is violation then uh, a kind of activity that um, uh, is just about, in a way, trying to be an antidote to a certain form of writing? Or is this very idea, the principle, the philosophy of violation that we are talking about is definitely uh, something fraught with all kinds of possibilities, resonances, reverberations and soundings. So is it that we are talking about violation as a kind of a poetics? What should really be the poetics of violation? What should really be the poetics and aesthetics of violation, the politics of violation? And once we start to focus on these areas, we try to determine and try to understand that this whole concept of theft, whether one talks about it as stealing, whether one talks about it as, as, as a breakdown of etiquette, if one talks about it as, as a disproportionate borrowing from some sources without appropriate mention, appropriate acknowledgement, is there a way 
to think about these things at the same time think a little beyond it to see that how this whole poetics of, of uh, this violation brings with it the idea of uh, authorship the idea of originality the idea of imitation the idea of stealing as a kind of an act or this very idea of cultural distinctiveness or a cultural identity or a particular cultural ethos that comes into the whole question of violation. Thank you very much for listening to this. I, have, I, I, I hope that I've been able to uh, cover certain areas. I hope I've been able to touch upon certain interesting areas, certain debatable areas for sure, and uh, have actually made you think a little beyond the very prescriptive, rigorous, almost dogmatic way of looking at what uh, uh, ethics of publications or violations of the ethics of publication or plagiarism for that matter can really mean. Thank you very much. <laughs>